Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Preeti Emmerich. I'm the Director of the Office of Emergency Management here in Anne Arundel County. Anne Arundel County has faced many challenges during my time here at the Office of Emergency Management. As with most large-scale disasters, the pandemic has had cascading effects, such as the economic decline and resulting layoffs, pushing many families into poverty. This, in turn, has led to community-wide community efforts that the Office of Emergency Management has coordinated with other county agencies. One recent example was addressing food insecurity in an equitable manner, from the food access warm line, assisting with food deliveries, and helping various pantries and food drives within the county. Much of the resulting response has highlighted the generosity and volunteer teamwork of the county's residents. Even during these trying times, the safe reopening of the county is key as we continue our regular work. Hurricane and summer storm seasons are here, and in the midst of a pandemic, present a real emergency planning challenge. The Office of Emergency Management is working with novels like novel ideas, new partnerships, and coalitions to help the county through this season. In our hurricane preparedness outreach, we are urging the community to follow FEMA and CDC guidance, such as wearing masks, maintaining social distancing, and preparing a go kit with hand sanitizers and disinfectant wipes. This will help residents prepare for an active hurricane season this year. I would like to thank the county executive for his continued support of the Office of Emergency Management and of its initiatives and for pushing for greater cooperation at all levels as we reopen Anne Arundel County in a safe and effective manner. Thank you all and ladies and gentlemen, County Executive Stuart Pittman. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you for being here um, or for tuning into the live feed that we're doing on this. Um, I'm Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman and uh, our county, like the state of Maryland, uh, like our country, like most of our planet, um, is in the midst of two crises. One is the coronavirus pandemic, which is a battle against a virus that has the capacity to overwhelm our healthcare system and take away the people we love in numbers far greater than most of our nation's wars. The other is an economic and humanitarian crisis that targeted the hardworking families who are the foundation of our economy, the families who are paid the least, who live in the least healthy conditions, whose children have the fewest opportunities, and whose access to health care, housing, food, child care, and transportation depend on a strong economy that can del deliver a livable wage every single pay period without, interru without interruption. The people of Anne Arundel County and the public servants who work for them have fought back against both of these threats. And we have worked hard to protect our people on both fronts, but that's not enough. We must do better. So I have called this press conference to announce two new initiatives, one to combat the virus, an enhanced effort that I am calling Keep Anne Arundel Open, and the other to prevent poverty, a package of three workforce assistance programs, including a new excluded worker humanitarian fund. Anne Arundel County has done well against COVID-19. We were the only jurisdiction in the state to implement universal contact tracing uh, on all positive cases from day one. We did it by changing people's jobs overnight, including our school health staff. We were also the only county I know of who brought scores of residents together early on to create a coronavirus health equity initiative, resulting in pop-up testing in locations where residents lack access to health care and wraparound services to facilitate isolation and quarantine for families with needs identified through contact tracing. 
We made a decision just this week to invest in a marketing campaign to better reach underserved and hard hit communities. And finally, our team at Economic Development created a small business grant program that funds best practices to protect customers and employees from the spread of COVID-19. So far, 628 small local businesses have been approved for just under $4 million in grants to slow the spread of the virus. Our county's positivity rate dropped from a mid-April high of 27% to a 3.5% rolling average just last week, the lowest of the big six counties where most of the coronavirus cases are reported. We were the first county in Maryland to report positive cases by zip code and have established much more aggressive testing goals than the state of Maryland. All of the credit for our success against this virus goes to our health officer, Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman and his team at Anne Arundel County Health Department, to our local businesses who have worked so hard to implement safe practices, and to our residents who stayed home when we asked them to, and for the most part have worn their mask and maintained their distance since that time. We were warned that success would be met with an angry response, that many would say that the threat was overestimated and that the price we paid to save lives was too high. I will not engage in that debate. The question before us is, what next? I've asked that question of our health officer, and I've discussed it with our recovery work group and many others. Will there be another surge, one stronger than the first? Will it come in the fall when or if our kids are back in school and when our activities move indoors? If our numbers increase, what will we do? Shut down our businesses again? Close our schools again? Lay off our workforce again? Failure comes with options that none of us want to face. In this county, we will act now to finish the job we started. We will act now to keep Anne Arundel open. First, we have set an ambitious goal of testing 2% of our population every single week, more than double the number that were tested last week. That's 11,600 weekly tests, with 50% being conducted by our health department and the rest by hospitals, primary care providers, and pharmacies. It's a detailed plan that Dr. Kalyana Raman will review in a moment, and it will take the cooperation of all county residents, local businesses, and county government to pull it off. And of course, we will continue our contact tracing and case management for every positive test that results from this work. Second, Dr. Kalyana Raman will sign a new public safety order today requiring face masks to be worn not only in public buildings, but also in outdoor public spaces where six foot social distancing from non-household members is not feasible. Like his existing order requiring face coverings in indoor spaces, this is a public safety order pursuant to the authority granted by Governor Hogan to county health officers. Third, our health department will be stepping up complaint-driven enforcement activity in bars and restaurants during evening hours. We cannot allow the actions of a small number of irresponsible business owners to cause an industry-wide shutdown like we've seen in other states. These initiatives, along with our contact tracing, our equity initiative, and the outstanding efforts of our businesses and residents are what I will now call our Keep Anne Arundel Open campaign. It's a campaign we must win to get our kids back to school and our people back to work. Dr. Kalyana Raman will flesh out for you this plan and sign the new public safety order. After that, I will come back to announce our three new workforce assistance programs, including our Excluded Worker Humanitarian Fund with Kirkland Murray. So, Dr. K, you coming up, and then I'll switch back.
Good morning. I'm Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman, the Health Officer for the Anne Arundel County Department of Health. Thank you, County Executive Pittman, for leading the way and for your focus on health equity during the COVID pandemic. We're four months into our new normal. We're doing well, averaging 20 to 30 cases per day while reopening businesses. However, this week we saw a slight uptick in our community cases. Around the country, we're setting new highs for the number of daily cases. Now is the time to redouble our efforts to push down the number of new cases per day and focus on prevention. We're focusing on three areas to keep Anne Arundel open, testing, masks, and enforcement to gain greater control over the virus, as the county executive mentioned. Testing allows us to find cases, both in people with symptoms and in those without symptoms, so that we can do the contact tracing and case management, provide support for isolation and quarantine, and break the cycle of transmission. Our testing goal is ambitious. We want to test 2% of the population each week, which comes to about 11,600 tests per week. Right now, we're just a shade over 1% of the population being tested each week, and with a test po positivity rate of 3.5%. To reach the goal of that, that level of testing, the health department will, will account for probably about half of those tests, and we're taking the following steps to do that. We're expanding drive-through testing. Right now, drive-through testing was expanded to six days a week in Annapolis at the health department site, Monday through Saturday. We added an evening testing option this week, and it was a great success with over 280 people tested. If it continues to be a popular option, we'll increase the number of evenings that testing is available. At our Glen Burnie site, which we run with the Maryland Department of Health two days a week, we started allowing no appointment visits last week and did nearly 500 visits yesterday. We're working on expanding the number of days of drive-through testing in Glen Burnie and are looking at sites to do that. COVID has had a disproportionate impact on blacks, Hispanics, and lower wage workers who work in retail. We started our COVID health equity initiative in April to address these gaps, and from that work, we're taking the following steps. Starting next week, we'll include percent positivity rates broken down by race and ethnicity to ensure that the positivity rates go down for everybody. Over the past two weeks, our percent positivity has been 3.5%. When we break that down, we see that it's 2.0% for whites, 2.5% for blacks, 2.9% for Asians, 12.4% for Hispanics. <clears throat> We've made tremendous progress and have reached parity for blacks, whites, and Asians and need to keep those gains. At the same time, we have not made enough ground in the Hispanic population and we need to redouble our efforts there. For over two months, we've been partnering with black and Hispanic communities to have two to three pop-up testing sites every Monday at various locations throughout the county and particularly in Annapolis. To address this gap, we're going to be expanding to have pop-up testing at various sites throughout the county five days a week. We're working with primary care practices to ensure that they're including race and ethnicity data on tests so that we know who's getting tested and make sure that there's equitable access to testing. We're working with the Economic Development Corporation to partner with retail businesses to get their employees and the public tested. I'm happy to announce our partnership with Gersbeck's Grocery Store and Atman Holdings to set up a one-day testing site at the Sun Valley Shopping Center. We're looking to develop many more of these partnerships so that we can make it easier to test our retail workers to keep them safe and keep these businesses open. For children, we find that they have less severe illness and, and are less likely to give the virus to others if they are infected. As we look to school opening in the fall, in whatever shape that takes, we're planning to have testing available in schools so that children can get tested if they're sick. We're also going to make testing available as part of our vaccination clinics, and we'll be talking more about flu shots during the fall, which are that much more critical this year. We're partnering with libraries, senior centers, public housing, and food distribution sites to bring testing to where people already are. And we're continuing our focus on congregate setting by supporting routine asymptomatic testing at, of staff in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, homeless shelters, and correctional facilities so that we're identifying asymptomatic cases and breaking that cycle of transmission. As part of this, we need the public to get tested. 
all of this capacity is so that we can make it even easier for people to get tested. To that end, we want people, if you have any symptoms of COVID, to get tested within 48 hours of onset. The sooner you get tested, the sooner we can break that cycle. Also, because you can pass COVID on without symptoms, we also encourage people to get tested about five to seven days after a potential exposure, which includes exposure to any person diagnosed with COVID, travel out of state or out of the country, being at a protest, being at a gathering or event, if you're out in crowds, whether shopping or dining out, if you work in retail, or frankly, for any reason that you have. All of our testing is available for both people who are symptomatic and those without symptoms, and it is of no cost. Masks are the second place where we're pushing, pushing further, and this is really because they're the single most effective tool we have to reduce transmission between people when distancing isn't possible. So effective tomorrow, a new public health order will require mask usage in public areas where six foot distancing is not possible. New studies show that states and counties with this type of order see lower transmission rates. Experience in other countries shows that universal masking keeps transmission rates low. This will, this will protect people when they're in shopping centers, downtown areas, outdoor parties, and other locations where people are coming into frequent contact with others. This is in addition to our current order requiring mask usage indoors in any business or in work settings where you can't distance. We're partnering with the Anne Arundel County Police and the Annapolis Police so that they can provide guidance, handouts, and masks to anybody who is outdoors and without a mask. Most importantly, we need everybody to wear their mask correctly so that it covers their nose and mouth like this. I think we all know too many examples of people who are protecting their chins or just their mouths, and that is not sufficient. For masks to be useful, they have to be worn properly. The last item is enforcement. We know that most businesses are doing the right thing, making changes to their spaces, requiring staff and customers to use masks, distance, and wash their hands. But not all businesses are doing this consistently. Every day we get at least five to 10 complaints about businesses not taking the steps they need to keep people safe, particularly in bars and restaurants. We'll be increasing our enforcement to evenings when most of these violations are being reported. We're also partnering with the Liquor Board for both the county and the city to ensure that these establishments are operating safely. Our focus on expanding these three areas of testing, masks, and enforcement will allow us to save lives, keep businesses open, and prepare for school in the fall. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirkland Murray of the Workforce Development Corporation. Actually, I'm turning it over to the county executive. I apologize. Thank you, Nilesh. We have a lot of work to do. Um, just when we thought we were uh, done, we're, we're buckling down. Um, so I said at the beginning <clears throat> that we're combating an economic and humanitarian crisis. It uh, may not feel that way to workers whose paychecks are still coming or people whose stock portfolio is doing just fine, uh, but it's getting desperate for tens of thousands of county residents and holes in our safety net are gaping. The response so far from our health and human services agencies, <clears throat> our churches, and our local nonprofits has been nothing short of heroic. We are feeding thousands of families through our school system, our senior centers, and a network of food distribution sites that people can access through an online map <clears throat> or by calling our new food line at 410-222-FOOD. That's 410-222-FOOD. Uh, our emergency operations center and the health department combined have taken over 50,000 calls since this pandemic began and directed people to whatever services they need. Our homeless outreach teams have moved people into hotels to allow distancing at shelters and our eviction prevention program was stood up early and became a model for neighboring counties, not only by providing $5 million to keep people housed, but also offering counseling and mediation with landlords. We created childcare centers for essential workers, kids in our senior centers, 
and our swim centers when the state kicked us out of our school facilities. Uh, and we're working now on a plan to address what we believe is a looming child care crisis. But still, it's not nearly enough. Today, we're announcing <clears throat> three programs that will be delivered through Anne Arundel Workforce Development. The first is the one that addresses the most urgent need, our excluded worker humanitarian fund. While 70,000 county residents have managed to navigate the complex and overburdened state unemployment insurance program, thousands more have either been left out due to bureaucratic failure, denied due to elig ineligibility, or never applied because they knew that they would be excluded. These laid off workers have basic needs to meet and bills to pay, and we don't have the time or the staff resources to decide for them how to how to distribute their limited funds. The most effective help we can provide to these workers is cash assistance in the form of a debit card. Every dollar we spend protecting these people from the harsh economic impacts of this pandemic is a dollar or more saved down the road in social services. We will start <clears throat> with an allocation of 4,000 cards at $500 each to total $2 million. When that runs out, we will assess the program and make a decision about further investment. My own view is that whatever, is that whether we look at this program through a humanitarian or an economic lens, it's a sound investment. By managing our excluded worker program through workforce development, we connect these workers to all of our job placement and training programs, including a second new service that we're launching today, rapid reemployment. We will bring our additional we will bring on additional staff to not only provide the traditional job readiness and placement services our agency is known for, but also to pay for the cost of occupational training programs in high growth industries. Specialized services will be offered in this program for formerly incarcerated job seekers. And finally, we are launching a youth employment program for 100 young people from age 16 to 24. Some will participate in a strictly online job readiness program and others will work with our county agencies in our communities. All will be paid a stipend of $11 per hour. I'd like to ask Kirkland Murray, President and CEO of Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation to provide more details on these programs. Come on up. Uh, when he's done, I will make a brief statement of thanks to our congressional delegation and an appeal to Governor Hogan. Mr. Murray. Thank you, County Exec Pittman. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kirkland Murray. I'm President and CEO of Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation. Um, we all know that the impact of COVID-19 has been devastating for many county residents who have suddenly found themselves unemployed. An estimated of 16,798 jobs paying $40,000 40, 40, a year or less have been lost due to COVID-19. The largest industries of these jobs are in accommodations and food service with over almost 6,000 jobs lost and retail trades with over 2,000 jobs lost. 44 businesses in Anne Arundel County have formally announced layoffs with over 5,239 employees being affected by this. As the county exec mentioned, that there has been over 75,000 new claims for unemployment here in Anne Arundel County, leading to 27,500 residents being unemployed in May. The unemployment rate has gone from 2.9% in March of 2020 to 9.2% in May of 2020. That's the facts. The good news about all this is that at a recent local workforce development board meeting that the county exec attended virtually, three out of our five industry representatives from three of our five top industries mentioned that they are currently recruiting. They have job openings that need to be filled. 
So that's why this program that the county exec just announced is that much more important to help to make sure that we're connecting people. But as the county exec says, and thank you county exec for your commitment and your investment in all Anne Arundel County residents and making sure that our excluded, Anne Arundel County excluded worker humanitarian relief fund will help those in most need. This would support residents who have lost their job due to COVID-19, who were making less than $25 an hour beforehand, and currently not receiving unemployment assistance. As the county exec said, we are looking to serve 4,000 county residents with this program. Next Monday, July the 13th at 9 a.m., the application process will go live on AAWDC.org, so at Anne Arundel Workforce Development Corporation's website. Then residents can submit their application. Once their application is reviewed by our staff quickly, we would then contact those residents and set up locations where they could pick up this debit card. As the county exec also mentioned, that is this the first phase of this to help to make sure that county residents can get back to work at good paying jobs. That then next we will connect them through Anne Arundel County's Career Development and Community Service Initiatives. This funding will help residents prepare to enter careers so they can quickly begin rebuilding their lives. Our rapid reemployment services will help residents quickly connect to new employment through a combination of career success services, including individual career development, career readiness services, including resume prep and interview skills, skills enhancement training to get new skills and certifications needed to transition and advance their careers and connect to employment opportunities through our recruitment network. Funding through this agreement, this program will allow 200 additional county res residents to get to receive occupational training at no cost of their, to them. This training, training will be in short term that usually lead to credentials that are in demand by our local businesses. Some examples include CNA, GNA, help desk, and CDL training. These trainings also will be used to put people into apprenticeships, connect them to apprenticeship programs through pre-apprenticeships and high growth industries, including the trades, IT and healthcare. As the county exec mentioned, we are also having a whole suite of services for our returning citizens community. These individuals are being, being have a double impact during these difficult times and we want to make sure that we're providing the quality services to reconnect them and give them the skills and opportunities to advance their lives. These services will help these residents prepare for careers aligned with their skills, knowledge, and background. Career readiness skills will provide not only help with individuals quickly connecting to employment, but also making a smoother transition. Barrier remediation services will help individuals overcome problems faced while looking for employment, including unstable housing, missing personal documentation, and food insecurity. These individuals will receive financial support while engaging in workforce services in order to help financially stable and increase their success. Part of this funding has already been put to work. Last Monday, we started our next success program focusing on youth and young adults. This funding will target 100 youth from the ages of 16 to 24 will prepare for their future careers through virtual services, job readiness, career exploration, and paid work experience. The first cohort of our virtual services began this past Monday. Participants will, work, participants will participate in self-paced, instructor-led career readiness training, career exploration opportunities with industry experts and learning essential skills and budgeting skills. This will culminate 
with a capstone project which will guide participants in their future career paths. Each week, the participants will learn about one of our five high growth industries in the county and in the region. And last week, they will explore opportunities on entrepreneurship. Through our partnership with Anne Arundel Public Schools, the Fort Meade Alliance, Anne Arundel Community College, and Growth Sector, 20 high school seniors began a six-week paid internship on Monday. These, stu these students will complete pre-calculus fu fundamentals at AACC, learn the foundation of computer science and coding, and engage in a project-based project learning experience with NASA, Garter, and Lockheed Martin. We are also working with our county agencies and organizations to find work experience for our youth and provide internships that will lead to valuable experience that will help these young people and young adults start on a career pathway. So in closing, I would like to thank County Exec Pittman and his administration for their understanding of the need for all Anne Arundel County residents providing that financial stability that's so important that when they're looking for a job and the resources to invest in people to get the skills they need to get back to work as quickly as possible but on good paying good jobs that will help the economy of Anne Arundel County. Anne Arundel County was one of the first counties leading in recovery in the Great Recession of 2008 and County Exec with your investment and your commitment and your faith in workforce development, we will then also lead the state of Maryland in their recovery after this crisis. Thank you again, sir, for your commitment. So, um, I just want to, before we take questions, um, thank our congressional delegation. Um, they were the ones that got county funding into the CARES Act um, not an easy task if you were following the process in Washington. And it is those funds that make all these programs possible. All of them are funded with our CARES Act allocation. So I want to thank Senators Cardin, Van Hollen, and Congressman Sarbanes, Brown, Ruppersberger, and Hoyer. Um, and my message to Governor Hogan is simply a request that he take a fresh look at the impacts of the pandemic as he makes his decisions about the use of the State CARES Act funding and how to balance the state budget in this difficult time. Child care, eviction prevention, workforce assistance are essential components of an economic recovery. Long-term economic health cannot be achieved on the foundation of a crippled workforce. So please invest in our people. So, do we have questions for any of the three of us? Mr. County Executive, you yes. said that uh, you're going to start next week, I guess it is, the uh, applications online for these debit cards. How can residents be assured this website's going to work? <laughs> <laughs> we're, hoping it wor fast. we're hoping it works as well as the, uh, the Economic Development Customer and Employee Protection Program worked, where we managed to get all those, all those 628 um, approvals done in about three weeks. Um, you can answer that, Kirkland. It's it's uh, it's your website. <laughs> <laughs> We're using. Gotta get the mic. We're using a JOX form. Um, we've contracted with them to create this application to make sure that it can handle that capacity. Um, trust me. Have understanding and been the one to ones that's been answering all the phone calls, a lot of the phone calls from constituents on the UI services. We wanted to make sure that this works, so we invested in that service to make sure. So the way the police are approaching that is to, as I mentioned, offer offer a mask to a person and some uh, 
and a handout to explain that. Our goal is to get people to actually wear the mask. If they're not going to do that, um, then a warning uh, and eventually fines. Still working out what those would be, but the uh, the initial enforcement will be a warning. So as part of our enforcement, we're looking at the, uh, uh, obviously, occupancy is part of part of what we're looking at, and then, of course, mask usage. Um, we're talking with, uh, we haven't had a case yet, but we're partnering with them so that if we, ha if we do find any violations, that it's part of the liquor board process as well, if there's a liquor license involved, of course, um, because all of those bars and restaurants have to adhere to occupancy codes, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. What will you do to continue uh, with this um, increased testing? Yeah. So between the, the testing, the education, um, the, the health line, we're hiring close to 100 people to replace those school health positions, and we're slowly having that turnover over the summer, uh, and we are on target to have that uh, workforce hired up by the end of the summer. Yes, that was important. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the groups that's excluded from any kind of uh, unemployment insurance are undocumented workers. And um, so we, um, at the county level, we do, um, whether it's testing um, for coronavirus, um, whether it's our eviction prevention program, uh, whether it's education, a lot of the services we provide, we don't ask people their immigration status. And so um, they're eligible. You go online and then, yeah. Go Do on they the actually talk to somebody or they, they? If they need to talk to someone, they need, a, they need assistance, yes, but mainly the application should be simply going online. Okay. Can you get that online, please? Yes. <laughs> yes, individual will go on online um, to apply for this to fill out an application. And then um, if they need to talk to someone, we definitely will have staff available to talk to them, to help them. Do we have Spanish translations? Yeah, the materials are going to be in Spanish translations, yes. We're in the process of doing that now. How long is the state going to last? The, you know, on demand, 4,000 people. Um, we're, we're hoping that we can get this out to people right away because people need this, fu need this funding. I mean, you know, again, these are individuals who have not received unemployment. Are currently not receiving unemployment, so they have this hardship. So we want to get this out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, once we, we're, you know, I've asked staff to make this a priority, and we're going to go through and evaluate these applications as quickly as possible. Set up times for people to come um, and get their gift cards. We will contact them, and what we're looking to do, um, similar to the program in Prince George's County, we're looking to do drive-through, just pick up, um, using very little contact. Um, that's why we're having people apply online, so we get all the um, information there, so that we could just give them their gift card, their um, debit card. Um, of course, they have to sign for it, but once they do that, very little contact, and drive-through. So we're in the process of setting up those locations. Yes. You mentioned testing and you do use your phone. How close to Anaheim County can we take a decision about what school will look like this fall? It sounds like you're going to be in school at least some capacity, right? Well, they talked about this at the school board meeting just uh, just last night, but the um, um, the decision first has to get made by the state school superintendent. And then within that decision, we'll know what flexibility exists district by district and school by school. And, and uh, that's when, if there is flexibility, the health officer will be consulted and plans will be made. Um, but 
Um, at this point, we are waiting for direction. Did I say five to ten complaints? I did. Oh, you did. Okay, then you can <laughs> you can defend that. <laughs> it's five to ten businesses per day, and there's disproportionately bars and restaurants, and it's coming from everywhere. Um, we are we're going out and, and talking to these businesses and observing uh, every one of those ones. Um, not all of those violations are founded, right? Some of them are, uh, we just don't see evidence, or there might have been something that just happened for a few moments. Um, but the ones that aren't doing a good job are, are not keeping space between people, uh, are not enforcing that, and are not enforcing mask usage within. Obviously, there are exemptions, but there's a difference between a few people and most people not having a mask on. It, it's up to the business to figure out how they're going to handle that. If they want to delegate that to the staff, they can. If they want to have a manager, that's up to them. But all businesses, both in the county and everywhere, are really expected to do that. <laughs> 